Well, we're going to approach what is for many people their favorite chapter, certainly of the book of Acts, and maybe even more than that. And uh, it's the address of Stephen. Uh, and I'm going to do something I don't normally do, but I just feel led to do it here. And that is I'm going to overlap a little bit some from last time. There's a very short little chapter, chapter 6, that we reviewed last time. But by way of review, I want to start with that to get the right setting for Peter's address to the Sanhedrin. So bear with me here if you would. So back in chapter 6, it said, In those days the number of disciples was multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. And it's speaking there, of course, of the, the Jews that adopted a Greek lifestyle and uh, against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. And so we're talking about Hellenistic Jews, their, their rivalry uh, with the native Jews. And uh, so uh, and the world outside uh, uh, that area spoke Greek, and that's why they impaneled the uh, people in Alexandria, the scholars in Alexandria, to um, translate the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures into Greek, which was the common tongue worldwide. So many of these people that are Jewish that came from other lands to visit Jerusalem spoke Greek, and they had a copy of the Tanakh in, in Greek to use. We call that the Septuagint version, and that's a, a resource that's available to us today. And so, uh, uh, so that was the whole purpose of the what Septuagint. And uh, they spoke, when they came back from Babylon, they spoke Aramaic, a, a close dialect to Hebrew. But the actual pure Hebrew was reestablished in 1948 with the reestablishment of the nation Israel. And that itself is a miracle. It was predicted by Zephaniah, incidentally, that they would return to pure Hebrew when that happened, and it did. And so, uh, so uh, but anyway, the twelve called the multitude, the twelve, that's the apostles, called the multitude of the disciples into them and said, is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. In other words, they felt because they're apostles, that's what they should be devoted to prayer and the word of God, that these administrative acts and waiting tables and things should be handled by others. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So it's notice that apostles don't pick the guys. They have the, the population pick the guys. Very interesting point here. This is the beginning of what we call deacons. Men who serve. And uh, so uh, these are impressive credentials required of them. Nothing trivial or incidental here. They had to be men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, that's a big one, and wisdom and whom they may appoint over this business. So, but we will give ourselves, the apostles say, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so those are, very, those are their primary priorities, of course. And it's tragically rare, of course, uh, in our society, we're so pace driven to actually be able to give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Anyway, following on then in verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. There, there's going to be a list of seven guys here. But notice who does the choosing it's the group, not the apostles. I think that's very interesting. And they chose Stephen, a man of full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and we're going to hear a lot about him, obviously, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And so it's interesting that, the, uh, that these are selected by the congregation. And we're going to hear a lot more of Philip in chapter, uh, the, the in chapter 8 in the next session. Philip has a very, very interesting experience that many people that read the Bible have no grasp of what's really going on there. And we'll get into that next time. Uh, Prochorus, by the way, is... Um, the guy that becomes an assistant to John, the author of Re Revelation. And Prochorus apparently later becomes the bishop of Nicodema. And so he's a guy we know more of. The rest of these guys we don't know a lot of. Um, they are all Grecians, that is Hebrews from, from uh, outside Israel. And one of them, Nicholas, was a Gentile converted to Judaism. It's interesting that it was the Grecians that were upset because their widows weren't being taken care of. And the group picks all Grecians to be the deacons, interestingly. Have four criteria. From among you, no outsiders here. They're good, in other words, they're all Christians. They're all Christians. A good report, good witness, and uh, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. And, uh, and notice who they picked. They were all Grecian Jews except Nicholas, who was a, a converted Gentile. And so it was interesting because it was the Hellenists, if you will, that were, feel they, they were getting shortchanged. 
So all seven picked were non-Palestine Jews. Going on to verse 6, and when they sat before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Very interesting sequence there. You never lay hands on some. We never ordain them to office without a lot of prayer and have that confirmed. Uh, there, there are many, many anecdotes, exam- anecdotal examples of people that, w- that had ha- hands laid on them that turned out not to, uh, uh, they shouldn't have. And Paul advises to be cautious of appointing an office. Make sure they're proven before they get those things uh, ordained, if you will. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And I think that's very distinctive. I can find several places in the New Testament where priests came to faith. Priests being conservatives, being Pharisees. Uh, I cannot find any place that there's a Sadducee that comes to uh, faith. And I think that uh, that may be just a matter of the record. There may have been some, but they're not recorded. And I think that's uh, that, to me, gives me pause in that direction. So... Uh, the priests uh, converted and so forth. And Stephen, here's the guy, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's interesting. Not just apostles did miracles. The deacons did miracles and created quite a stir. And that's really what we're going to find with not only Stephen, but Philip and probably others. And so Stephen, full, full of faith and power. And uh, he was called to wait tables, but he demonstrated great spiritual power. He is one. Stephen is one of the great men in the early church. And you'll see why before this session is over. And apparently these deacons are one with the apostles and having sign gifts. That's important to understand. The sign gifts were not restricted just to the apostles. The people that uh, make a thing of that, they're wrong. Uh, Here the deacons have uh, those kinds of gifts, apparently. Then there rose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. These are all Jews Outside, from outside Palestine, that are Sadducees. They're liberals. And they're really agitated by the popularity and the stirring that Stephen is causing. And so uh, he was a strong witness of the gospel. So he incurs, obviously, the hatred of the Sadducees. We need to recognize we're no different. If we're doing our job, we're going to incur the hatred of people who deny the supernatural. Just understand that. And... Uh, So in this case, false witnesses were brought before the council to accuse Stephen. In continue verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So then they suborned men, that is, they bribed guys, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. That was the testimony. It's a bald-faced lie, but they were uh, incentivized to do that. And uh, Stephen, however, was effective in his speeches. They didn't get very far. These are not true statements they're giving. They're made by false witnesses. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. So they claim he's speaking against the temple and against the law. And we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. And shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Those are the assertions they're making. Two accusations. To destroy this place that is the temple. And to destroy the law. And all that sat in the council. Looking steadfastly upon him. Saw his face. Like what? Like the face of an angel. That's a very strange record by Luke. Here. Interesting. Well I call this mission impossible. You see Stephen is a new Christian. And yet his insights and background are staggering. He is going to know the Old Testament, the Tanakh, better than the Sanhedrin. Watch what he does here. It's going to be, he's going to go up against the Sanhedrin, the elite, the ruling, the ecclesiastical people of Israel. The Sadducees dominate this group. Understand who he's talking to. It's a formal council. It's a formal hearing. And it's the leadership. And he's going to take them all on. Stephen's been accused of espousing a separation of the law of Moses, and he's going to answer his accusation in such a way that shows that he is more Jewish than they are. That really is what he accomplishes here, much to their chagrin, of course. So we're going to explore in this session one of the most favorite uh, chapters in the book of Acts. This is a review of the history of the nation Israel and a review of their resistance and rebellion against God as recorded uh, 
in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. He charges the council of being betrayers and murderers of the Messiah of Israel. And that, of course, does nothing more than engender their bitterest hatred and leads to him being stoned. And he takes that. uh, he He is not a martyr because he died. Rather, he died because he was a martyr. The word martyr actually means witness. Many people get that upside down. So let's jump into uh, my friend Hal Lindsey says is his favorite chapter. I still have fond memories of teaching this at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I said I did the Monday night studies there for about 25 years. But when I happened to be doing Acts 7, Hal came and visited with his wife, sat in the front row. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting to have my dear mentor and friend uh, sitting at my feet. What a surprise that was. But this is, he indicated that, that privately this was one of his favorite chapters. He wouldn't miss it. Anyway, ch- chapter 7, verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? See, he's giving Stephen a chance to respond to the false witnesses. And uh, so Stephen is going to take a review here, of, a review of the entire Old Testament. And so uh, Stephen's going to point out many details that most Bible scholars have overlooked. This don't be, don't be surprised with some surprises that we'll uncover through Stephen's efforts here. First of all, note who's on trial here. They think he is. No, it appears that the Sanhedrin are. He's going to turn the tables in effect and put them on trial. And I think this is when. So he says, verse 2, this is Stephen. Men, brethren, and fathers. Men, brethren, those are his peers, and uh, fathers, those that are senior to him. Hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. He, start, uh, he, is start, he's, he chooses to start with the first Jew. One would regard as Abraham as the first Jew, if you will. Our father Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. Now, this is a very interesting subtlety that he deals with here that many people don't realize. And so, first of all, he calls them brethren in flesh, and he also calls, calls them fathers. He's a younger man, and he shows them respect. Okay. He says, the God of glory... Stephen begins and ends with God's glory. And he was before he dwelt in Haran. Now he's going to begin with an overlooked lapse of faith on Abraham's part. Many people miss this because they don't look at the text in Genesis 12 carefully enough. There is a 25-year delay in Abraham responding to what God called him to do. And many people don't know that. You see, God, uh, if you look at Genesis uh, 12, it says, God had said. The phrase there in the text points out that what happened had happened before, and Abram finally gets around to following. As Stephen points out here, he says, God said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. God is saying that to Abraham when he dwells in the Ur of the Chaldees. To get out of the land, leave your father, and so forth. Abraham doesn't do that. He moves up river for 50 miles to Haran and waits till his father dies. 25 years, apparently. And then he responds to what God called him to do. There's a 25-year lapse there that Stephen calls their notice to that most people don't pick up because they don't read the text that carefully. God had said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Okay? See, notice what God had called him to do. To get out of your country, which was the Ur of the Chaldees, to get out from thy kindred. He doesn't do it until his kindred dies. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran, That's moving up river, not leaving the country. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land uh, wherein ye now dwell. Subtleties here, but Stephen is highlighting this to make a point. He is going to indicate there is a pattern in Israel that they always blow it on the first call 
and they fulfill it on the second. That is his uh, hypothesis throughout his whole talk here. From thence, when his father was dead, he didn't leave his father, he waited till he died and then left. So uh, Abraham's original call was from the Ur of the Chaldees, not Haran. Haran was 50 miles upriver. If you look very carefully at the text in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses, God had said, and he finally obeys. Abraham was called an Ur, he moved to Haran, he did not move again for 25 years later when his father died. He didn't really do what his God called him until his father died. You could consider that 25 years a years of disobedience, a lapse of faith in a sense. However, interestingly enough, his hint, uh, Abraham's sin is blotted out. You can read the text and find it if you look hard enough, but it's not highlighted, if you will, in the text. It's alluded to in Hebrews 11. Now, this discrepancy about the ages will only show up if you realize that Abraham, uh, only if Abraham is Terah's firstborn. Listing first does not imply the order of birth, but the order of importance. And there are examples of that. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, sons of Noah. It was Ham that was the youngest, and he's mentioned the middle. Japheth was the oldest, and he's mentioned last. Um, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the older one, yet Jacob's mentioned first. See, the order is not necessarily in terms of their ages. And so Moses and Aaron, you see. Aaron was older than Moses, but Moses is always mentioned first because he's more important. They're listed in, in the order of importance, and you need to be sensitive of that so you don't, don't jump to other conclusions. Ephraim and Manasseh. Again, Manasseh was the oldest. These are all examples where the oldest is not necessarily mentioned first. The more significant of the two in terms of the Holy Spirit editing the text. Okay, so there may have been other sons of Terah, by the way, besides Abraham. Nahor, because Rebekah was his granddaughter, and Rachel was also his great-granddaughter. And uh, Haran, was, is, it was because he was the father of Lot, and uh, so on. So Stephen's point here is that there was a lapse of faith on Abraham's part. Most people don't pick up on that. Stephen makes a point of it in his address. And of course, this is not lost in the Sanhedrin. He's rubbing their nose in it, in effect. And if you want to see, if you want to see a complete study of Abraham, we encourage you to take a look at our expositional commentary on the entire book of Genesis to go into all that. Now, there's a consistent historical profile here. Watch carefully Stephen's key points. He is arguing that Israel is always unresponsive uh, in the flow of their history. Yet God's purpose is always persistent. God is persistent. Israel is always unresponsive. The first time, they finally get it on a second occasion. That's their pattern throughout their history, Stephen points out. He starts out with Abram as he, in a sense, was the first Jew. Their history was characterized by rejection the first time, and acceptance the second. That is their point, and he's going to climax that when they reject their Messiah. And what's implied by his whole outline is that he, if, he would, if they hadn't stoned him, if they let him finish, he would point out that they will accept him on his second coming. And that's the point he's making here. Let's go on here, verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. In other words, God promised the land to Abraham before he had any children, meaning he would have promised he would have seed. Okay? And so you need to recognize that the land was promised when he and Sarai were beyond childbearing age. And that was, of course, a big surprise. And God spake on this wise, that his seed would sojourn in a strange land, and that they would bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for 400 years. This was obviously what God had told Abraham. In, uh, in, uh, 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 now we know they would entreat them evil for 400 years, but we know from Exodus 12 and also Galatians 3 that they were down there 430 years. That sounds like a contradiction. No, there were 400, the last 400 that they were abused. The first 30 years, they had a pharaoh that knew them. And that changes, of course, subsequently. It's interesting that Stephen always quotes, makes his quotes from the Septuagint. I think that in itself is provocative. And so, now is there a discrepancy here? Well, there are three possible answers, round numbers. 
is, is in Genesis 15, 13, it mentions 400 years. The last 400 of the 430 were the ill treatment, not all 430, in other words. Now, if you count from the recognition of Isaac in Genesis 21, 12, it will turn out to be uh, 400 years. Anyway, let's move on to verse 7. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Now, by the way, Satan knows that. And that gave Satan four centuries to lay down a minefield. And once again, he lays down Nephilim in an attempt to corrupt the path to a Messiah. The same thing that caused Noah's flood to be brought is going to be... Uh, is reinstated within the land because Satan can take advantage of this. He's got 400 years to lay down his minefield, so to speak. Well, Stephen continues here. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So these 12 patriarchs, of course, become the head of the 12 tribes as we, uh, as we think of them. That when they say patriarchs, they really mean the head of each of the 12 tribes. But there's another term. I, don't, I want to pause here and just call your attention to. I can't resist this. Abraham circumcised uh, his son Isaac on what? The eighth day, right? Well, let me tell you something a little bit about that. I think this is kind of interesting. It turns out there's a vitamin K, which is a clotting element, which is not formed in the newborn child until the fifth through the seventh day. That's when it's first formed. So if you do it earlier than that, you, su you suffer the possibility of continual bleeding and no clotting. There's also a, a um, thing called prothrombin is also necessary for clotting. On the third day, it's about 30% of normal. On the eighth day, it peaks up to over 100% of its normal value and then levels off. Let me show you this graphically, if I may. Here are the blood clotting factors. If you look at vitamin K, it slowly builds up and uh, prothrombin does also. In fact, prothrombin goes over 100% on the eighth day. So if you know all this and can graph this progress in a child, you know that if you're going to circumcise a male child, you want to do it on the eighth day. You do it too early or later, you run some risks. Eighth day, it's designed to be done. Now, the question that this raises in my mind is how did Moses know? How did he know to do it on the eighth day? Um, these things are necessary. As I pointed out, how did Moses know to circumcise on the eighth day? When Genesis 17 that's what he's instructed by God to do. And uh, did Moses know that by trial and error? <laughs> I don't think so. Think that through a little bit. <laughs> okay. So I think that's kind of fun. So anyway. And the patriarchs, let's get back to the text here. And pa the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with them. And obviously, everyone that's read their Bible is familiar with the incredible saga of the story of Joseph. In the, from Genesis 37 to the chapter 50, it's the saga of this incredible career of Joseph. But notice this, that uh, they sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Let me point out something to you. Pharaoh is a title that is equivalent to the king of Egypt. It's not necessarily hereditary. It's not necessarily hereditary. Made him governor over Egypt. And all. Now, the Pharaoh made Joseph the prime minister, if you will, the governor over Egypt and all his own house. That's the incredible destiny of our friend Joseph, okay? But jo he was hated by his brothers. But as Jesus said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And Joseph is in a sense a foreshadowing of the Messiah. Arthur W. Pink, in his book, Leanings in Genesis, actually has a list of over a hundred ways that the life of Joseph profiles the, in anticipation, the life of, uh, of our Lord. And uh, so, um, uh, he actually has 101 ways that Joseph is, in a sense, a, what we call a type of Jesus Christ. 
And so, now Stephen is going to point out again and again that the very guy which God sent, their forefathers beat up. Okay? Here Joseph was hated by his brothers and they sold him into slavery. Yet this was in God's plan all along. God's plan was executed in spite of, or I might say in anticipation of, the reaction of his brethren. Okay? Think that through now. Israel's misapprehension of God's purposes and their opposition to them, in spite of which, and by means of which, they were accomplished. So see the whole tone of Stephen's recounting Israel's history, that it's always Israel that's wrong. They always oppose what God wants them to do the first time, and they finally get it the second time around. Now notice here's something else. Now there came a dearth over the land of Egypt, in other words, a famine, of the land of Egypt and Canaan, and, uh, or Canaan, and uh, great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. That's the build up the story here. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. It was a, see, see, you notice how, how, how uh, Stephen is emphasizing it's the second time that things get set right here. Again and again, Israel does not recognize him until the second time. That's the pattern. So what Stephen is setting the stage for here is if history is the guide, then Israel will not recognize her Messiah until the second time, not the first time. You've, you're, he's talking to a group that rejected Christ the first time. According to their pattern throughout their history, they'll get it right on the second time round. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. Threescore and fifteen. Now Stephen is quoting from the Septuagint, which has seventy-five souls. This, the Hebrew Bible says seventy. All the scholars believe that the five difference is the additional kindred of the seventy that went there, <laughs> but they don't agree on which five it was. So as a little bit of background there. Let's keep going. Now, here's something more important here. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over to Sechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sechem. Now, this creates a problem because this, the people are, some of the scholars argue about this. There's confusion over the burial sites. Most commentators say that Stephen made a mistake. I don't believe that. But it turns out that there are two different burial sites in Genesis. One was brought by Abraham and one was bought by Jacob. So it's not a contradiction. There's two different burial sites. And uh, the one bought by Abraham was in Machpelah. The one that was bought by Jacob was in Shechem. From whom? Abraham bought his from Ephron the Hittite, Jacob from the sons of Hamor, or Shechem's father. And that's in Genesis 33. The one Abraham bought is in Genesis 23. And uh, who buried him? Well, um, who's buried there? The one that Abraham bought at Machpelah was Abram and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. Pretty impressive. The one that Jacob bought, that's where Joseph is buried, according to Joshua chapter 24. And probably, but we're not sure, the 12 patriarchs may be buried there. Some, if not all of them. The problem is that... Um, there are no mention of the 12 patriarchs burial by Hebrew writers. Why? Because that region is in Samaria. But Jerome and others do record that. So uh, that isn't as authoritative. But um, the Hebrew writers tended to dismiss S Samaria as uh, part of the blighted North, North Kingdom and so forth. So that may be part of what's going on here. But the confusion emerges simply because there are two different burial sites. That's really the point. So I mentioned that in passing. Not a big deal, but if you encounter people who say the Bible's got contradictions, not exactly. There are some alternative views here. Some say it's an error. I don't think so. Uh, some say Abram originally purchased and Jacob repurchased. I don't think so. The, 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 the uh, reconciliation I gave you, I think, is the correct one. Uh, the altercation with the sons of Hamer over the property bequeathed to Joseph is recorded in Genesis 49, so there's some discussion about that. So I'm mentioning all of this primarily so that you don't be too quick to accept some commentator's view that there's an error. Sometimes there are, there are manuscript problems. 
but to praise God for the contradictions because behind the resolution may lie another discovery. So I urge patience here. But here is the one that I think is really interesting. But when the time of promise drew nigh, which God hath sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose, which knew not Joseph. We all know the story of the Exodus. But because we're dealing with Greek, there's a little surprise tucked in behind the translation here. When in the Greek, you use the word another, you've got two choices. Uh, in the Greek, there are two words for another. If I, want, if I ask you for a pencil and I use the word alos, that means I want a pencil exactly like this one. Another one like this one. But if I want a different kind of pencil, I say, give me another, a heteros pencil. That means I need a pencil, but a different kind of one, a red rather than black or something. Follow me? Two words in the Greek. Okay. Now, so there's a significant period of time occurs between Joseph and the Pharaoh of the Exodus, obviously. The Greek word heteros is used when you want another of a different kind. The word alos means another of the same kind. Stephen is using the word heteros here, meaning another king of a different kind. The king of the Exodus was not an Egyptian. That's the real point. That's what he's telling us here. And if he's not Egyptian, you can begin to understand that this group of slaves that are starting to multiply start to become a majority. And he's on a slippery rock. He's insecure. So to protect himself, he starts subjugating them, treating them as slaves and abusing them and, and, and exercising his political strength. And another, another king, a different kind, which knew not Joseph. He had no commitment to the history of this prime minister here. And so, we know from Isaiah 52, verse 4, that the Pharaoh that oppressed the Hebrews was an Assyrian, not an Egyptian. And that explains why he was insecure and why he was so uh, uh, insecure and, and uh, oppressive during the period that we know as, as the Exodus. That's something that was missed in the research lying behind the movie, The Ten Commandments, which leads on Ramesses and a whole other thing. And one of the things you might just put in your notes if you want, there's a guy by the name of David Wohl, W-O-H-L. I don't believe he's a Christian, but he's an, a, a fantastic Egyptologist. And he's made a lot of discoveries which essentially have turned the traditional view of the dynasties in Egypt upside down, turned them all around. It happens that his discoveries tend to link up just remarkably accurately to the biblical record. I'm not suggesting he's a Christian, but he certainly has done some extensive books and background that are very iconoclastic. They very, they very much uh, turn over the traditional academic sequencing, which has all kinds of problems. There are major translational problems that have led to the confusion of the Egyptian dynasties. So if you're going to get into that, make sure you really do your homework or you'll begin into some real confusion. But in any case, interestingly enough, the pharaoh of the, of, the, of the Exodus was an Assyrian. How do I know it? Because it's, it's recorded in Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 4. Okay, so here we have our friend Stephen before the Sanhedrin, and uh, he laying out a pattern of failures. Abraham's failure in, in verse 4. Joseph's failure in verse 13, if you will. Moses' failure will show up in verse 27, and the law in verse 35, and Joshua in verse 45. There's just a pattern of failures that he will lay out here. So anyway, let's go on here in verse 19. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. Nourished up, by the way, the term there is interesting. It's of young children and animals nourished to promote growth. It's a technical medical term in the Greek. It's again Luke's editorial going on here. He's, 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 it's, it's the vocabulary of a doctor. 
uh, interestingly enough. We see that all through the book of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, there are several places in this chapter where the term used is one that only a doctor would use, which is interesting, because Act was written by Luke, a physician, who had a larger vocabulary than Hippocrates, who's considered the father of medicine. Hippocrates has left a lot of writings, but the vocabulary of Luke is larger, fascinatingly enough. Well, let's go on here. When he was cast out, speaking of Moses, when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him in and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Quite a statement. That has some surprises hidden behind it. Obviously, we all know the story about how Pharaoh's daughter brought him up as her own son. Pharaoh had no, his own son, so Moses would have been the next in line, apparently. Interestingly enough. Okay? Mighty in words. That means he lied, by the way, because if you look at his dialogue with God in Exodus 4, he says, I'm a slow speech, and uh, a slow tongue, and so forth. No, he wasn't. He was really quite articulate, according to our friend Stephen here. But more to the point, Josephus points out that Moses was mighty in the military arts. He was being groomed for leadership in Egypt. You need to understand that. That's one thing the movie Ten Commandments brings out, that he was really being groomed to be a prince of Egypt. And uh, Philo also points out that Moses was tutored by the most celebrated foreign schools in arithmetic, geometry, music, philosophy, hieroglyphics, and the arts and sciences. That all sounds pretty good, doesn't it? There's a dark side to that I want to touch on here, by the way. You see, Egypt, of course, had developed mathematics, chemistry, engineering, architecture, and astronomy to a very fine point. I'm not knocking them. They calculated the distance to the sun. That's a non-trivial exercise. The, the, the knowledge of the Egyptians are astonishing on the one hand. Okay, Now, so they had a highly developed culture. They were not an ignorant people, and yet... There's something interesting that you should know about them in terms of their medicine, Egyptian medicine. In the Papyrus Ebers, which was, is dated at about 1332 BC, we learn a lot about the culture in those days. If you have an embedded splinter, what did you do? You apply worm's blood and ass's dung to it. That was the remedy. Uh, if you're losing your hair, what you should do is apply six fats. Fats of the horse, the hippopotamus, the crocodile, the cat, the snake, and the ibex. Did you know that? I thought you'd want to know that if you want to uh, you repair losing hair. Or if you're turning gray, what you should do is you anoint the blood of a black calf which has been boiled in oil or fat or the fat of a rattlesnake. Did you know that? Isn't this wonderful stuff? By the way, what should your medicine cabinet include in those days? Well, a well-stocked medicine cabinet should have lizard's blood, swine's teeth, putrid meat, uh, moisture from pig's ears, milk goose grease, asses hooves, animal fats, excreta from animals, human, donkeys, antelopes, dogs, cats, and flies. Did you know that? You want to go home and check your medicine can make sure you're not deficient in these essential ingredients. And obviously I'm being facetious here, but the point I'm going to make here I'm in, uh, uh, is um, Moses was schooled in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So while he learned obviously a lot of great things, he also was exposed to this kind of error. The point I'm making is what's fascinating is not only what's in the Bible, in the Torah, the books of Moses. What's amazing is none of this nonsense found its way into the Torah. You would have thought somebody coming from that culture would have inadvertently, here or there, said something that was wrong, inappropriate. We find none of that in the Torah. So not only was... Moses had the benefit of the right schooling, which, which set him well, I'm sure. He also was guided by the Holy Spirit to keep out of his right. We know now, by the way, that the five books of Moses have mathematical properties of the way the letters are arranged that are absolutely impossible to anticipate, even using computers. And what's interesting is if you remove just one letter from the Torah, many of those properties evaporate. So what that tells us is not only did the five books of Moses, that they were given to Moses by God, they were given to Moses letter by letter. Now that's an outrageous declaration, and I say it 
in the hopes that you will challenge that. And I encourage you to take a look at the cryptography that undergirds the Torah, the books of Moses. And we have a number of materials on that if you're interested in that. So, but anyway, none of these superstitions were retained in the Torah. In contrast to things like circumcision that we just mentioned, things like hygiene, there's all kinds of hygiene things that are in the Bible that are, anticipate the discoveries of medicine that as, is, is as recent as the 19th century. And uh, the nutrition standards and so forth. It's astonishing to discover how contemporary the Bible is in those terms. And I'm indebted, of course, here to a book by Dr. McMillan called None of These Diseases, where God promises Israel, if you follow these things, none of these diseases, the diseases of their Gentile neighbors, would come upon them. It's a very, very revealing medical uh, uh, review of the idiocy of the history of medicine that doesn't get corrected until 18, 1900 years after Christ. That uh, throughout all those years, the, the, the embodiment of hygiene and these things in the, in the text has far more power than most people are aware of. A neat book. But anyway, getting on to verse 23. Speaking of Moses, and when he was full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. This was Moses being groomed as a prince of Egypt. And he finds that one of his own uh, was being uh, oppressed and he kills the guy that does it. And uh, he assu- what you don't get from the text, but Stephen points out to you here, he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. That was Moses' intent. But they, the other Jews being abused, understood not. Okay? They understood not. That insight is not clear from the account in Exodus, but Stephen, by the power of the Holy Spirit, highlights it for us here. So Stephen's point is that here again, Israel is slow to apprehend the divine purposes of love. Again, they're rejecting the, their leader the first time. It will be later, after 40 years in Midian, that he comes back and they accept him the second time. He's pointing out they rejected him the first time. We don't pick up on that reading the Exodus account. Anyway, uh, Stephen points out, on the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them, once, uh, uh, set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one another? But he and his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou did, didst the Egyptian yesterday? And when, when Moses realizes that's been known, he thought he, it was a secret, he buried him and all that, uh, he gets pretty shook up. So it's analogous to what Christ said in Matthew 21, by what authority and so forth. So anyway, then fled Moses at this saying, and he was a stranger in the land of Midian, and it doesn't say this here, but for 40 years. So he's 40 in Egypt, and he's 40 years in Midian, then he'll come and have the Exodus, and he'll spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they didn't take advantage of Kadesh Barnea and all of that. Anyway, so he was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begot two sons. And so Israel had to stay 40 years longer because they did not recognize Moses to deliver the first time. So he cools his heels, so to speak, on the backside of the desert. And uh, uh, the implications here is that if they had accepted Moses then, that God might have delivered them then. But because they rejected Moses the first time, they were stuck with another 40 years of bondage. And it's the second time that he comes. See the pattern that Stephen is laying down here. Who made you a ruler over us? That echoes exactly Matthew 21, 23. And also Hosea 5.15, where Jesus himself says, I will go and return my place until they acknowledge their offense and again, so forth. And uh, John chapter 1, in John's gospel, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, and so forth. Anyway, continuing here. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. Here's a bush that's burning but not consumed. That's a model of grace, by the way. The acacia is the thorn bush of the desert. And here's a thorn bush that doesn't get consumed with its burning. That puzzled Moses. He went up there to check it out. 
He wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. This is, of course, the burning bush. The acacia is the thorn bush of the desert. Thorns are a symbol of the curse from Genesis 3.18. In fact, Jesus bore that on his brow on, at Golgotha. Not only painful, but very symbolic in terms of him bearing the curse. And the fire that was burning the bush symbolizes judgment. And the fire that doesn't consume symbolizes mercy. Or grace, if you will. This is what it is. It's always God's grace. It's not His holiness that attracts us. It's His grace that attracts us. Anyway, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses trembled and durst not behold and then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. How interesting it is that that's exactly what he said to Joshua when he appears to Joshua in the chapter 5 of Joshua, the book of Joshua. Put off thy shoes. Shoes are an interesting study. You, know, you can take one of these words and do a word study in the Bible, and it's very rewarding. Shoes are a symbol of the calling, because there's no shoes in the tabernacle. It's a symbol of divine provision in the wilderness, because their shoes did not wear out in those 40 years. It's a, it, for Boaz, it was a marriage license, his permission to step in and, and take a Gentile bride, Ruth. It's also a symbol of stature, because John the Baptist himself says, I'm not worthy to unloose the shoes, and so forth. So the shoes are a very, very interesting study throughout the Scripture. It is that each one of these uh, phrases have a consistent spiritual application cover to cover in the scripture. But continuing in verse 34, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. That's God instructing Moses from the burning bush. Who is the voice of the burning bush? Jesus is. In John chapter 8, he claims to be the voice of the burning bush, by the way. An interesting side study you can get into. Anyway, this Moses whom he refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? This same God did send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. And he brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. You realize there's three forty years here. Forty years in Egypt, forty years in Midian, then forty years in the wilderness. Wow. After 120 years. Man. This Moses whom they refused is his point. See, the second trip is when they accept him. First time they rejected, second time they accept him. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This Moses which said. See, Moses himself foretold the coming of Christ in Deuteronomy 18. Moses quoting the prophet in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where Moses predicts the Messiah. That's the, the, uh, the whole point here. Stephen clearly understands grace as opposed to the law, and in this line of teaching would give rise to their ac accusations. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Stephen, his point is that Moses himself predicted the very person whom they are now rejecting. This is this deacon instructing the most august body of the, uh, of the nation in front of him, the Sanhedrin. In this entire passage, Stephen is venerating Moses even more than they do to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. They're out, and they're given the Ten Commandments. The first time they reject it, they're destroyed. God had to do that a second time also, as you know. The deepest dishonor of the nation that professes the greatest jealousy for his honor. Boy, the deepest dishonor from the nation that professes greatest jealousy for his honor. How ironic. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up 
to worship the host of heaven, as is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? He gave them up to, the, to worship the host of heaven. The host of heaven. Baal is Mars and so forth. Gave them up to the host of heaven, meaning the stars and the planets and all of that. Psalm 81 deals with that a lot of other places. Idol worship is still in their blood, and these idols are linked to the planets, by the way. You can get into a whole study there that we'll try to not spend too much time on. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch. Moloch was this brass altar that they heated up and put their babies sizzling to death in the arms of, of this pagan worship of Moloch. And the star of your god, Rephan, which figures that, that we made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon, God speaking to them. Now, Raphon is, is uh, recorded in Amos 5. Uh, the star of Raphon is Septuagint for Kion, which is the Coptic name for Saturn. So uh, these are pagan worship. Moloch was this pagan thing for uh, infant um, uh, mentality, and uh, Raphon was, a, uh, was the planet, somehow associated with the planet Saturn and so forth. Baal was associated with the planet Mars and so on. So Saturn is associated with also the worship of Moloch, the idol of the Ammonites and Phoenicians, with the solar bull, that is Taurus, if you will, the brass statue with human body, bull's head, arms outstretched, worshiped by putting your children in his arms of brass with fire all around. The children would roll off into the fire. It was child sacrifice done there in the Valley of Hinnom and uh, in their history, shameful history. It's interesting that the Babylonian idea graph for a planet, by the way, is a sheep plus uh, 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 the, the meaning for sheep plus dead is in their idea graph. A sheep was a sign of augury or an omen. The planets are viewed as a mechanism for ca- forecasting the astrolog- in an astrological sense. And here it shows up even in the very linguistic structure, if you will, in Babylon. We have five planets in the days of the week. You know, we, you know, we have five planets plus the sun and the moon give us our seven days of the week. The seventh day is Saturn's day or Saturday, even today, even to this day. These all have their roots in Babylon and uh, so on. So it's interesting. The seventh day is not Saturday. The seventh day is Shabbat, God's own day that he singled out for himself. Not Sunday, Shabbat is the seventh day. And this whole field of astrology, everything we know about it started in Babel, but it goes far deeper than this idea of a horoscope that we see today that somehow your future and your character are determined by the position of the stars at the moment you're born. Um, that's not an idea that goes back to Babylon. That particular style of astrology turns out to show up for the first under Ptolemy in about the second century A.D., about 130 A.D. But astrology in its deeper senses all have their roots back in Babylon. That's a whole other study. Astrology is a form of deception far broader than uh, that... that, uh, that uh, than the kind of astrology you see today. Uh, and uh, obviously it's all mixed up with the ancient cultic literature. Astrology is expressly prohibited by the God, by God in the Old Testament. And uh, so if you run into somebody that's in astrology, you might ask them if they now have to redo all their horoscopes since the discovery of Neptune and so on. Because that's all relatively recent in history. And we can go on. There's, a, there's a, the astronomy magazine, the astronomy, which is a different thing, and it often gives you a list of 10 questions to ask the astrologer, and they're all pretty embarrassing. Astrology is not only occultic, it is nonsense. It's pretty silly. Uh, it's ridiculous, actually. But let's move on here. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Gee, um, S- Stephen gives us another little insight here that... Um, according to the fa- fashion that he had seen. Somehow he saw the uh, thing. And uh, so, so when, when you see Moses coming down from the hill, having ten commandments under his arm, you ought to put under his other arm a bunch of engineering drawings because he brought back detailed specifications for the tabernacle and all its furniture. And so, uh, but here Stephen points out that Moses actually saw the tabernacle and its furniture if not in heaven as a vision or what have you. He somehow saw all that. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into, and here in the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of fathers into, unto the, uh, the days of David. The word Jesus here is actually referring to uh, Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew. 
The Greek term is Jesus. And so it's a translational issue. We should say Joshua here. And uh, Stephen here is talking about Joshua, the son of Nun, who was the successor to Moses. And these little subtle things are well known in the King James. As you know, I'm on the board of review for the International Standard Version of the Bible, and they obviously don't make these mistakes. In fact, they do something very interesting. They don't speak of the children of Israel. They speak of Israelis, and that creates a lot of stir. You don't find the word Christ in the New Testament. You find Messiah. So it's got subtleties that are helpful because they focus our attention. Uh, there's a number of exegetical discoveries and also discoveries in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are unique to the ISV. So you might want to be a, 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 take a look at that. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob? But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples which are made with hands, as saith the prophet. See, they originally accused him of desecrating the temple. And he's not disparaging the temple, but pointing out that God does not dwell in a house made with hands. And he's quoting from Isaiah 66, the first two verses. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? What is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? See, their veneration of the temple is far beyond what God intended. God continuing here, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. And as your fathers did, so do ye. This is Stephen accusing the Sanhedrin. See how he's turned the tables here. You are just like your fathers were. He uses Moses' very words from Exodus 33. Uncircumcised in heart. He's quoting there from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 10 and Jeremiah 9 and Exodus 44. And Paul, too, by the way, quotes these in Romans and Philippians and so on. You can get these from your notes. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. This is Stephen laying the indictment on the Sanhedrin. National trait. Deadly hostility to the messengers of God. That's his theme. And even Jesus makes reference to that. There's a lot of allusions by Jesus himself that they always kill the messengers. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So the major climax is recorded in the last few verses of Matthew 23. The purpose of all history, the tragedy of all history, and the, the uh, restoration of all history. The last, uh, Matthew, last three verses of Matthew 23. Lay that out. The purpose of all history in verse 37. The tragedy of all history See, the purpose of all history, I would gather you as a hen gathers chicks. The tragedy of all history, ye would not. They rejected it. But the triumph of all history in verse 39 is that he ultimately will succeed. And that is there uh, portrayed. Jesus himself summarizes the exact point that Stephen is making before the Sanhedrin. He did that in Matthew 23, and Stephen's picking up on it right here. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed him on with their teeth. Wow. That's a strange phrase. Gnashing of teeth is a Hebraic way of expressing extreme disappointment or anger or rejection. It isn't necessarily soteriological. It isn't necessarily meaning of hell or something like that. It is sometimes used with other phrases that do imply that. But it's just a Hebraic phrase. It's, uh, gnashed is a medical term in the Greek, by the way. And uh, national it's a Hebraism for extreme disappointment or frustration. It's not necessarily soteriological. But moving on, verse 55, and but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Wow. Jesus standing. Standing, because uh, that is the role of the priest, to be standing. There were no chairs in the tabernacle, you may recall. Standing is used twice, both in this verse and the following one. And behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Interesting phrase, the Son of Man standing with... They've heard this before from Jesus when he was in trial. The next time you see me, you're going to see me in glory, he says in Matthew 27. And he also said it in Luke chapter 2, by the way. The Son of Man, that's an unusual title. That's God's designation of himself. This is the only place that it's used by someone other than Jesus himself, by the way. Jesus is standing, 
and standing in the role of the priesthood. He's in the role of the priest of the order of Melchizedek. We know from Psalm 110 and other passages. Stephen becomes the first martyr, but that is backwards. He's not a martyr because he died. He died because he was a martyr. Martyr means witness. And uh, so be a good witness to the end. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Don't get the impression he's a passive bystander. I suspect he was one that helped stir up the anger. Because he himself, in his career, will look back and never cease to grieve over being involved here. He himself will comment on this later on in his own writings. He isn't just a bystander. And uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he deals with this. He never forgave himself for this. He grieves in his letters of this very incident. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive... Excuse me, they stoned, they stoned Stephen calling upon, he was calling upon and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now we don't know Saul's reaction. He's obviously a member of the Sanhedrin and he heard this whole chapter laid out before him by Stephen. And I suspect it was ringing in his ears when he encounters Jesus on the Damascus Road two chapters from now. That'll be in chapter 9. We're going to go next session. It'll be in chapter 8 with some surprises of its own. When we get to chapter 9, we have the encounter of Saul with Christ himself on the Damascus Road, which changes the whole course of all history. But that's coming. Comparing the two deaths, I think this is worth doing. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Stephen said, Lord, receive my spirit. See the parallelism? I think this is of the heart, not, not contrived. There is a parallel between the two. Well, we are at the turning point in Acts. Saul persecutes the church, which will cause the apostles to move out. Because of Saul's persecution, the, the, the apostles get scattered, and that's healthy for the church, strangely enough. So, but we're going to now turn, we've been to, remember, the marching orders to Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. Next chapter, we're going to turn to Samaria. And then the following chapter, we have Saul, it'll start to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, chapters 9 and 10, we'll move to the uttermost parts of the earth. 10 will be Cornelius and all of that. So, here we are. We have just taken a look at chapter 7 which, as you can tell, is one of my favorites. And I'm just, I never uh, get over how much we've learned about the Old Testament from Stephen's commentary. This is inspired commentary. This is commentary sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. It gives us insights that many of the commentators of the Old Testament have missed. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised the more we study chapter 7, we may find some other things in the subtleties of... See, the Greek is so precise. There are subtleties tucked away there that we may have yet to discover. So this isn't any complete, but I think it is a lesson for us to realize that the Word of God is inexhaustible. And all these... We have subtleties here. We always say that the Old Testament is in the... The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And here's another example of it. That it's, a, it's probably, one could, argue, one could argue, the most sanctioned commentary on the Old Testament is Acts chapter 7 by this deacon, not an apostle, a deacon, Stephen. And uh, what a guy. What a, a heritage he's left us. Very, very important. But next time, we're going to see a fourth persecution of the church, this time really energized by none other than Saul, because he hasn't, it isn't until chapter 9 that he has his encounter. But we're going to discover something else. Several things will occur in chapter 8, but one of them that is widely misunderstood by virtually everyone I've looked at, misunderstood by the Ethiopians, misunderstood by the Jews, and misunderstood by most commentators, we're going to see unravel before us and we're going to see some background that has been there all along in the Old Testament. 
And so if you really want to do a little background for next time, I encourage you to read 1 Chronicles 30, uh, 35. Verse 3 talks about Josiah asking them to bring the Ark of the Covenant back in the Holy of Holies. But you might read that whole chapter because tucked away in some of those verses are some surprises that we will indulge ourselves in next time.